It's like seeing a thunderstorm in the summer. Like right here, you know, you can see it, you know it's coming. You don't really know when, but you know damn sure it's coming. This is going to become a Wall Street company, and our stores are on Main Street. It's a family here. Our company's really a tight-knit family. A shocker in the contentious saga involving members of the Demulas family. Diane Arthur T. has been surviving repeated efforts to kick him out until today. It was a unanimous mandate provided to the CEOs and that there'll be no further discussion with them until Arthur T. Demulas is brought back. Supervisor of Operations Joe Schmidt says employees are concerned about outsiders hired to run Market Basket. The dispute over management at the Market Basket supermarket chain continues today. Tom Trainer, one of the organizers. Upset, mad. That's Rosie Hagopian describing her feelings as she watched the clock tick to 4.30. We asked a yeah, question It's, it's, it's a pretty ago. remarkable. There seem to be two factors at play here. One is this fear that the new executives are just trying to set the company up to be sold and then a good chunk of the employees aren't going to have jobs. And, uh, kids in the Seabrook store told me it was all over the internet and uh, I was shocked because it said that those three fellows Arthur and uh, Billy and Joe had been fired uh, pretty generic release and I remember being shocked and, and I was a little afraid and then I remember thinking uh, gnarly predatory thought thinking well it's game on now game on I remember distinctly thinking game on uh, I didn't know where it was going to go I assume it wasn't going to go to a good place but I was ready to uh, you know do what we had to do I don't think that any of us expected it to come to that and yet we weren't bluffing. So here we are, not bluffing. Now we don't have jobs, what do we do now? You know, um, and we walked out and the media was all over the place. How long have you been here, sir? Uh, 45 years. And you're prepared to leave? Absolutely. Every person who walked that day, and it wasn't 100%, but every person who walked out that day with the intent of not going back in until Arthur T. was back made a personal choice to fight. I tell you, I've, I've, I've known Arthur DeMoles 42 years, and you can rest assured that he would never, ever send me a letter like this. What's it say? It says, if you choose to abandon your job or refuse to perform your job requirements, you will leave us no choice but to permanently replace you. Okay? You know something? You want to permanently replace me, start with me. Right? But I'll have a lot of guys next to me. You know, we didn't think twice. Is This is what we needed to do. We just, everyone just emptied out whatever they had to empty out and we walked out the door. In the summer of 2014, the largest non-union labor walkout in U.S. history would take place in the unlikeliest of places. Everybody from the CEO on up, on down, has worked their way through the ranks, starting at the lowest levels. And these two people were from outside. We don't take direction from people outside. Just because the board gives them a CEO title, my boss is Arthur T. DeMolis. Always will be. I can't even say that I was thought I was the head of a labor movement at that point. I really didn't expect this thing to last more than a week. The daily saga of the unassuming band of rebels behind it would captivate a nation. These people are here to just destroy what we spent our entire lives doing, all these people we talked with. They've all been here since they were 16, 14 years old. When we heard that there were two new CEOs that were being brought in to take this place over, it was just foolish. If these guys are going to come in and they think they're the boss, good luck to them. They're going to need workers to do the work because we're not going to be here. 
Armed only with loyalty, dogged determination, and with no knowledge of the workings of labor disputes, their accomplishments would confound business leaders, economists, and academics. They wouldn't break the rules regarding labor disputes. They would rewrite them. They wouldn't create a mere distraction for a $4 billion corporation. They would bring it to its knees. Really, there was no other option, and there was no other way to go. This was it. It was either Arthur T. DeMoules as president and CEO running this company with his management team, or it's over. And where most labor walkouts are about long lists of complex demands, this one was about something very simple. What we want is Market Basket, and what we want is our old CEO back, the one who did it all right from the beginning. I built this place. This is their story. The largest non-union labor walkout in the history of the U.S. didn't involve auto workers, miners, or textile workers. It took place at a family-owned grocery store chain in the Northeast. The Market Basket supermarket chain was founded by Greek immigrants at the turn of the 20th century, and over the past 100 years has grown from a single unassuming neighborhood market to one of the country's most successful food retailers, with more than 70 stores and extensive real estate holdings in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. They take a very people-centric, no-frills approach to doing business. There's no self-checkout, no website, and no automation in either of their centralized warehouse facilities. Yet they thrive, are profitable, and almost always expanding. It's more than 25,000 associates are some of the best compensated in the industry. They're paid above market wages, have excellent health benefits, and profit sharing. Employee loyalty and longevity at Market Basket is something that most firms can only dream about. With more than 2 million customers shopping at their stores every week, Market Basket offers some of the best value in the industry. There's no loyalty card at Market Basket, Yet their customers are incredibly loyal. Their customer service, exceptional. And their prices are on average 15% or more below that of their competition. So how did it come to pass that over six weeks during the summer of 2014, thousands of Market Basket associates and nearly all of their two million customers would walk away from the company they had all been so loyal to? And how is it that management, employees, and customers of a multi-billion dollar corporation would fight with such unflinching solidarity to save their piece of the American dream? I think it starts with any new associate that joins the company. Um, a lot of them start at 14, 15, 16 years of age. And a lot of the people that come in don't understand what it is to put on a white shirt and a tie for a, a gentleman or a, a female to wear a nice blouse. Um, so it starts there. It starts with the, the process of this is our company, welcome. Here are our dress code requirements. We want you to be a part of the team. Um, we want you to look professional because when you look professional, you are professional. And that's something that uh, is very important in the overall aspect of it. So it kind of sets the business tone right from day one. There's, there's such strong cohesion about what the company means to people. Um, you can ask people at any level of, at this company, uh, any function of the company, and they'll tell you the same thing. They'll talk about service of the community. They'll talk about family. They'll talk about how they're a little different and distinctive than others. Arthur DeMoulis comes along and tells you no job is more important than another. No one job is more important and you all have merit. Who the hell says that this day and age? Who? They're very loving, and that's a strange word to use in business. They haven't found any love in most uh, corporations. That they really do have a special relationship with the people. 
Adi, not that long ago, bumped into a woman, and she said, nice to meet you, Mr. DeMoulis. And he said, very nice to meet you. Uh, are you a new, new employee? And she said, no, I've been here for 16 years. And Adi said, 16 years? How could it possibly be that I don't know you? Well, there's, all, there's about 26,000 FTEs in the company. And he said, uh, it won't happen again. I'm going to come by and see you. He said, and I, I apologize for not knowing your first and last name and more about your family. I mean, he, he looked at me and said, I can't believe I don't know him. The boss has said a million times, he's beaten me over the head with it so many times. We're in the people business first, the grocery business second. At the end of the day, what it comes down to is if you put in a good, honest day's work, you'll have people that appreciate it. You'll feel a part of something greater, which I think is something that everybody wants to do in life. They want to be a part of something bigger. It's a work ethic. You know, we, need, we expect quite a bit out of people. We expect you to come in, hit the ground running, and work. You know, it, it's easy to get the impression with talk of family and service to the community that this is an easy place to work, right? And it's not an easy place to work. You know, when we get a lot of these people that think it's the greatest company in the world, when they come in, they, they don't realize how much work it is. We work hard, and we don't mind working hard because of who we work for. He treats us well, and we, in return, give it back. Mark Sturzo and his brother Chris have worked at Market Basket since the late 70s. In 1999, Mark had a stroke. When Mark went down, he, he was obviously in ICU. And I went in and I sat down with Mr. Rockwell and Mr. Marsden, and they told me right off that Arthur DeMoulis said, and Mike DeMoulis said, don't worry about anything. The checks are going to keep coming. Just take care of your brother. I mean, what company does that? What does that tell you? What company right. does that? The first time I went down to see Mr. D, he was sitting in his back desk. I was like this, shaking. I couldn't mutter a word. Mr. DeMoulis looked at me and said, why don't you come back and see me tomorrow? I went home, I practiced on what I was going to say, up and down, up and down. I finally got to meet him. I told him I was looking to buy a house. And uh, he goes, where are you buying? I told him, Lowell. He helped me out with a mortgage. He gave me his bank, his lawyers, and I bought my first house through Market Basket. And that was with Mr. D. When you speak with many of the associates there, you get the sense that they're feeling like, like, I owe the company something. It's given me just a little bit more than I've given them. It's something I haven't seen at other companies. Yeah, I wanted to be the first female store manager for the company, but I wasn't. But the one they picked was a very solid choice. It's not all roses all the time, right? I mean, they have competition. There's, there are arguments, there are disagreements. I don't get along with the bakery people all the time or the produce people all the time, but don't mistreat them because we're on the same team and you're not part of it. In some ways, this is a, a throwback right, to the days of staying a long time in a company, and so you were that kind of a family. I started at the age of 17. 17 going on 18 years old. 14 year old. 15 years old. Yes, I've been there about 40 years, and I'm very, very rarely the senior man in the room. Uh, I've been a vendor uh, in the commercial bakery uh, department at Market Basket for over 20 years. At that time, it was 1950, 1958. 1974. Uh, 1980, you know, 1978, since 1981. My first job was a bagger. You either start shagging carriages or ringing a register. You know, you see the other people and say, how long have you been here? And they say, Oh, I've been here 15 years, or I've been here 20 years, and I'm like, seriously? You've been working in a supermarket for 20 years? But you know what? I've been there 21 years now. I, I don't know what happened to me, but the same thing. You don't leave. Athanasios, or Arthur de Moulas, and his wife, Ephrosine, emigrated from Greece in 1906 and settled in the city of Lowell, Massachusetts, after working in a local tannery for the first few years, Arthur returned to Greece in 1912 to fight in the Balkan Wars. Upon his return in 1917, he started the first Demoulas Market on Dummer Street 
and a section of Lowell referred to as the Greek Triangle Acre. It's a store that becomes, as did a lot of other immigrant stores, a centerpiece of the neighborhood. It's a place where people go to get news from home. It's a place where people go to find out politically what's happening in the city. It's basically a place where you can gossip um, and learn about what's happening. And so markets like uh, Demoulis' market at the time are really important cultural beacons. As the store becomes bigger and then as more stores are added to the chain, it also is indicative of the fact that Greeks as an immigrant population are making it economically. The family itself is this institution in a way and it's, it suggests if you work hard, if you do the right thing, you can become successful in America. Demoulis' youngest son, Telemachus, also known as T.A. or Mike, became involved in the business in 1938. Mike DeMoules took over the, the company at a very young age and started to develop a culture that was unlike what we've become used to in, in our corporations, public and private, in the United States. Mike's oldest brother, George, joined him in running the family market. And in 1954, the brothers purchased the business from their parents. It just happened with Mike and George and then they for some reason or other, they saw opportunities to expand, and they took it. Over the next 17 years, they managed to turn their parents' small neighborhood market into a thriving franchise, expanding to 15 stores. They, they got along famously. Mike was a strictly, you know, business, and George was a little softer. If there was anything, anything he, he was the one that calmed things down a bit. I'm sure it was a tremendous, horrible thing that happened to Joy. In the wake of his brother's death, Mike took over the business, expanding it aggressively, while at the same time providing for his brother's widow and four children. He provided them money for housing, education, and starting businesses. None of George's children, however, seemed interested in taking their father's place in the family business. Arthur Estimulas and his brother Angelo were, were employees of the company. They were actually put in a supervisor position along with uh, Arthur T. And um, th they didn't want to work. You know, they didn't show up for work. And then you would get visits from, from T.A. Demoulis and uh, he would come into the store and he would say, when was the last time you saw my nephew? And sometimes you couldn't answer, you know, and you didn't know what to say. And you'd say, in three or four weeks, I'm not sure when I saw him. When it could have been a month, it could have been, you know, two months. In the 70s and 80s, Mike acquired much of the stock from George's family and estate, reducing their equity in the business from 50 to 8%. In 1990, a family feud erupted when George's heirs filed a lawsuit claiming that they had been defrauded. Mike's position was that the purchases were in response to the family's request to sell. George's heirs didn't see it that way, neither did the courts. The result was a bitter, nearly decade-long legal battle for the Demoulis supermarket chain with a series of scandals and countersuits on both sides. It ended with the courts siding with George's heirs, ousting Mike from the presidency of his beloved business and awarding majority interest in the firm to his brother's heirs. The most active among them was George's son, Arthur S. Demoulis, who sat on the company's board of directors after the ruling. Arthur S. Demoulis is, is, a, is a person that has uh, um, an awful lot of, of uh, ideas about how the company should be run. And he was in the unfortunate position, even after the court case, of not being in, in control of the company in terms of uh, uh, the majority voting. The key to his loss of control was George's daughter-in-law, Raffaella, voting with Mike's side of the family. This gave more control to rival cousin Arthur T., who remained a key executive after the court ruling. That really hurt him. It also made him very, very angry. And I use the word angry because that's what I saw. He was always um, very, very negative to, to his cousin and that side of the family. He really wanted to run the company at some point. And that probably was never going to happen. The people would never have accepted him. And you're not going to get anywhere in the market basket unless you're one of the hottest workers in the place.
Even though his name was Demoulis, that doesn't mean we have to respect you just because your name's Demoulis. We still have that been there, done that, got the t-shirt thing, even with somebody named Demoulis. That was between them. It was a family matter and nothing to do with what, how the company was being run or what was happening with our, comp with, with our business here. It wasn't on our minds all the time. The company ran just as well when the board was in the middle of a temper tantrum. We could start in with something as simple as a new location, and it could take three hours to get through that discussion with personal attacks on people because they, somebody didn't like the way they said something or they didn't like you know, their, their particular point of view or people accusing you that you were in the bag for one person or the other, and it happened both ways. In 2003, T.A. DeMoulis passed away, leaving the company he devoted his life to in the hands of his bitterly divided family. Despite nearly two decades of sustained growth and more than a billion dollars paid to shareholders in the form of dividends by 2013, there were signs that Georgia's heirs had become frustrated as they watched millions being invested into areas of the business they felt they had little or no control over, such as the firm's extensive real estate holdings. The place grew tremendously if you look at its numbers, just sheer number of stores from the late 50s through the late 80s, early 90s. It hit 50 stores, and that's a tremendous pace by any metric. The mid-2000s, we were at about 59 stores. And now, by 2013, we were at about 70 stores. So, a very short amount of time, he really got the ball rolling had a board that was in place that understood that this company was well-oiled, get out of its way and let it work, keep, it, keep the parameters where they should be, keep it in check, and let it go. Even though the company had experienced incredible growth after his appointment as CEO in 2008, there were signs in 2013 that the delicate balance of power Arthur T. held onto was about to change. And along with it, the fate of the 25,000 associates of Market Basket. Public officials here today, uh, very much like all of us here at Market Basket, enjoy being amongst the people, and we also enjoy serving the community. You know, in its simplest form, it was, it was one side of the family that uh, the non-operating side that wanted a liquidity event, but the other side wanted to grow the franchise bigger to help more people. And in helping more people and putting your money to work, you're going to make more money, but also you're going to help more people in the communities that they want to help. I mean, it sounds almost non-business, but it's, it's, it's absolutely what grows this franchise. Real or not, we knew that there was a woman out there with the power to go the wrong way. Didn't think she ever would with the way the company was thriving. We figured everybody was winning, so you'd be a fool to want to disrupt that. But it happened. After years of supporting Arthur T's successful growth strategy, Rafaela Evans switched her vote to the Arthur S side of the family in 2013, shifting the balance of power to the Arthur S side and allowing for the ratification of a new board, which would include three new independent members. When the A's certainly wanted liquidity, which was suggested by this new board, that's what they came in. I think that's really what they came in to do, is, is to have a liquidity event. She piggybacked on it, and, and I don't blame her at all, but I think she, she was a very good shareholder for a long, long time and helped us grow the company tremendously. How are we doing, Todd? It's disturbing when you've been taught and cultivated to believe that, you know, we have a responsibility to those individuals. And Arthur believes strongly and has taught us all that, you know, first Mr. Manager, Mr. Supervisor, Mr. Bill Marsden, you know, you've got to take care of your people. You've got to take care of your customers. Because, you know, without any of them, we're not going to have anything to share. And you've got a new faction that's involved that says, listen, I want more. I want more. At the expense of all these people that have built this business, that was the fear that was going through everybody's mind, including myself to some degree. He wanted to make sure that, that, that 
he got out when he wanted to get out. And it took him years to do that because he, he, he didn't have the votes. Uh, and once he got them, he changed the board. And then, you know, the last year was very difficult. When, when, uh, when Terry Carlton and I were in the minority position in the board, we got steamrolled. We need to do something. And it's not necessarily my skill set in such a short period of time. The petition I started was to save Market Basket and uh, Arthur T. within that. We hoped to get a couple hundred people to sign it. By the next morning, we had 10,000 people signed up. Tom and I, I remember us talking, saying, this is big. There's an army of people thinking the same way we are who want to fight this thing. Power of the internet, social networking. With the balance of power now in his favor, Arthur S. could clear the obstacles in his path to control. His first obstacle would be his cousin, Arthur T., at the July 2013 board meeting in Andover, Massachusetts. We decided, you know, the board meeting is next Thursday at the Wyndham Hotel in Andover, where they always held the board meetings. And we figured we'll get as many people there as we can, and we'll just lie in the streets with signs, we want RDT, and please don't fire him. What Arthur S. may not have realized was that his actions would fuel a movement, a movement born from a culture that he had not been part of. No question in my mind. I don't think there's any question in the boss's mind. He would have been fired that day were it not fired. It was 2,000 people. Round one, market basket. But we got to sleep with one eye open now. While Arthur T. would survive the July board meeting, Arthur S.'s move to control would continue with the $300 million dividend paid to shareholders. The payout would severely strain the company's cash reserves. Major expansion projects ground to a halt. You know, my, my father, Mike DeMolis, you know, he left high school in 1936 during the Depression to go down to that little store in Dumber Street to help his father, my grandfather, to work the store to pay the bills. And paying the bills to hard working associates and vendors and contractors has been a hallmark of our company ever since. The best interest of this company I said, there's going to come a day, someday, if you mark my words, you're going to give a victory speech from the back of my pickup truck. Bill Shea go up there was very powerful. And that just shows the, you know, the difference between Bill Shea and some other board members on the other side is he brought himself out. The RDT brought himself out. RDS never came out. He shied away from everything. He didn't come and speak to the people. Either did, did any of the other board members, did they come speak to the people? No. Arthur T would file suit against the board, alleging its actions concerning the dividend were improper. Judge Fabricant made her decision that basically said, I'm not going to make a decision. Um, so she allowed things to go the way they were. The money was taken out of the company. And at that point, I was just so disgusted. I said, listen, we've got to take matters in our own hands. This court system, we're not going to get anything, any justice from this court system. And this board of directors is, is primed to destroy this company, in my opinion. And we can't allow that to happen. He's still here, he's still with us. We did everything we, we always did, you know? We just continued to do our job. There was an undercurrent, there's no doubt, an undertone of, of unease. And it made life very stressful for everybody. Finally, on June 23rd, 2014, one year after losing control of the board, Arthur T. DeMoulas, along with key executives Joe Rockwell and Bill Marsden, were fired and replaced by co-CEOs Felicia Thornton and Jim Gooch. I was shocked they fired him that day. We had some agreements to help the new board run the company with Arthur in there, and they just blew that up. That was awkward, having them walk in the building with these security guys, and they came in with a whole computer team. When we first got word that Mr. DeMoulis was let go, and I called that meeting and I let everybody know about it, a lot of guys were just standing right there and we'll, we'll walk out right now. When I got out of the meeting, I talked to him that evening. Right away, it was, uh, let's get together and, and, and plan 
how we're gonna get the company back. It was around this time we put up a post about resistance, asking people to resist any overtures from them. So this is a beginning for us. And yesterday, I was in turmoil. When I woke up this morning, there was an email from my son. He's in San Diego on the Coast Guard. He saw the news on, on the Facebook site, and I'm not gonna read it to you because it'll bring me to tears again. Basically, he said, Dad, you've done all you could. But I'm not done. It solidified my my decision to stay. Be a commando and cause damage. So those who's, who are cynical about it say, well, it was only about their jobs. That's wrong. It was about their jobs, of course. Or cynical and saying, why would anybody fight for a CEO because they could turn on them any, at any moment? They don't understand that that fight for that CEO was not only for the individual, but symbolic of the business, the culture, and the trust that was, that was built up over time. Gerard Levins showed up at the Indian Ridge Country Club with the Andover Police Department and tried to change the locks and fire all of the staff at the Indian Ridge Country Club, which is part of Damula Supermarket's property, and they are Damula Supermarket Associates, in the middle of a member guest tournament. Felicia and Jim. They sat down on the couch. They just go, you know, we're not here to hurt anything. You know, this is a well-oiled machine. I just looked at them and I'm like, are they kidding me? And she shook my hand. She went on a merry way. I said to myself, oh my God. They are no match for, for the strength and the commitment that Market Basket has for the passion they have for the business and for the CEO. The call went out through social media. We got people mobilized. That was the beginning of, hey, we can't trust these people. What are you guys doing? You just told people 24 hours ago you're not going to fire anybody, and you're down there trying to shut the place down and fire 10 people. We have one demand. Reinstate Arthur T. Demoulis as president and CEO, unrestricted in his duties, or we will walk. And ultimately, it came down to giving a deadline on, I believe, July 17th. And believe me, I would much rather be selling groceries and stocking shelves and talking to you guys. This is not what we do. This is not what Bob Ferranti, who's listening back there, does. This is not what we want to do. We're not very good at it. We're at the point now where it's a question of conscience for all of you. I can't tell you what to do. Tommy Gordon can't tell you what to do. Tommy Trainer can't tell you what to do. So you know something? Now, tomorrow, all those chickens are coming home to roost because he's took, taken care of a lot of people for a lot of years, and those people are the ones that are gonna come back here tomorrow, and you're gonna see it, you're gonna see something. This is, is unique. But I will tell you one thing, is I'll be here tomorrow morning, but I'll be outside. So I went home that night, didn't know what the hell was gonna happen. You know, it's easy to be, uh, it's easy to be the guy at the top of the hill saying, follow me, but you turn around, you certainly hope someone's there. <laughs> That first day when I got up and went to work wondering how many people were going to be standing behind me, they were out in front with me on Friday. A small spoke and a big wheel. We pulled most of the spokes out. In the words of David Ortiz, this is our fucking company! few days, eight top managers who were involved in that action were fired. We got fired on that Sunday the 20th. We had a rally planned for Monday in Tewksbury. The company didn't own that property. So we got permission from the people that own the property to be there. And they put out the thing on social media, we're going to have a rally on Monday at Tewksbury 8. There was just tremendous excitement in the air. And it was a lot of very positive energy, just a tremendous crowd, like you would see at a rock concert. One day you have a rally and a stage is being set up, and there's a microphone and there's speakers. How did that happen? We don't do rallies. They knew how to do it. It was a, it was a very basic sort of a setup. A truck and thousands of people. I see Joe Schmidt up there looking like a Kennedy. We shall be victorious. We shall be firm in our resolve. 
All of a sudden, Tom Trainer is Bruce Springsteen. Yesterday, I was fired. Today, I'm fired up. It's funny how people were groomed for this battle. When we go to store opening, Steve Palenka gets on the PA. And when the store's over, he's back to being Steve Palenka, who's quiet. He was cutting his chops to be the MC of the rallies to save Market Basket. You can do this. You can make history. I know they were watching the 12 o'clock news, the board meetings, the rallies, the lawyers' offices. It was to keep the people involved, keep the pressure on, get the communities involved, and give the boss a tool with which to bring this deal to a close. When my father passed away, he left nine girls and two boys. And we decided that the giraffe was going to be our family mascot. Because we did not be afraid to stick your neck out. Oh my God, did it resonate. You couldn't buy a giraffe in Massachusetts and New Hampshire all last summer. We have two million devoted customers that are got our back. We have 25,000 associates against five directors and two incompetent CEOs. Did we have tremendously formulated plans, all right? This happened now, we're gonna do this tomorrow. No, no, no. Not in my case, anyway. The rules of the road of general labor law did not apply in this particular case. There was no contract that was being renegotiated, so there were no, there was no rules, there was no box that all of this fighting had to happen inside of. There were no three minute rounds or whatever a boxing match would be and judges and scoring. This just was gonna be over when it was gonna be over. We decided that the best way to do this would be to shut down distribution and store support, which meant everybody in the office and all of the warehouses. And in that way, you would still have the stores open. They would still be getting a paycheck. You would affect the least amount of people, yet do the, the maximum amount of damage. We needed help. We needed help from the media. We needed help from the customers. And how are you going to make this happen unless you hit them in the wallet? Why did they fire us on a Sunday evening? That's just odd. I mean, I can understand Senator Curry because they don't have guts. But why, why on a Sunday afternoon? I'll tell you why. Because the board of directors must have called them this weekend and said, get this thing straightened out. Sorry, it's too late. We're shutting down. Well, the CEOs, I mean, they were just out of their, their regular textbook, you know, how to, how to run a company or what to do. I, I don't know if they expected, you know, the, uh, for this the massive amount of people to stop working that did and for this to shut down to happen. Key people have just been eliminated from the company. People that have dedicated their entire lives to making the company everything that it is. And you cast them aside like it's nothing. And you think that you're just gonna throw those people out and then it's gonna be business as usual? Really? You know, do you, do you have a clue? Do you know anything about the company to begin with? We weren't picking orders, delivering, sending out orders for that day. Right then, I mean, it was done. But like I said, it was only two days by that Sunday. These stores were, you could see there's not in other cases. In a week's time, the stores were bare. A new board came in. They still felt that they could get a team in there and they could, and they could work this out because they had co-CEOs that supposedly had uh, experience that, that would, would help the new board. Uh, that was disputed uh, a lot by, by the rank and file of, of uh, Market Basket. I don't plan on working for Felicia Thornton and Jim Gooch in the future anyways. You know, because the way they're running the company, there'll be no company left to run. <laughs> we got this new megaphone, everybody. We got it at Radio Shack. 75% off. Thank you, Gooch. That's for you. Thank you. But I think they really felt that they could, they could get the thing up and running again. 
And I think that's where uh, certainly one of the, the A shareholders, while the council said, hold it, uh, we don't believe that. This battle, which Arthur S. Demoulis thought would be a one-on-one -on -one battle between his family and the other side of the family, then took on the front of associates, and then took on another front of customers and vendors, but the customers ended up carrying the day. We are here as customers, um, basically boycotting Market Basket and putting more money into the pockets of corporate Greed America. The revolutionary started here, and we're going to finish this revolution as well. USA Market Basket Strong! Yeah. The idea of the customers boycotting was not our idea. I wish it were, because it was brilliant. And, but that was as organic as anything on this. The customers did it. The customers asked us what to do, and we said, support us. And they said, you know what? We know what to do. We're not going to shop there anymore. Former Market Basket CEO Arthur T. DeMoulis says he's offered to buy out the grocery store chain, taking control back from family members who ousted him last month. WBUR's Jack Lepiars reports that many customers are staying away from stores, which are running low on supplies. This is a safe haven. The customer that has a very frenzied life is now being asked to go to a store where they're looked at as a, as a number instead of a person. We've got 14-year-old baggers up front that know customers by first name, 20,000 customers a week. We've got baggers that know customers' names and their kids' names and their birthdays. If you take the philosophy of shareholder first and you just try to reward people by their self-interest, that, sort of, that sort of a model doesn't create these connections between employees and customers that we see at Market Basket. And what we see at Market Basket is um, a situation where employees and customers have this very tight-knit bond. They don't always know each other by name, but they recognize each other and they see each other and they, they feel a, clo a certain closeness. What is she here for? I came here to see you. <laughs> I did. I told Shirley, I said I haven't seen him. Yep. What would you do without Market Basket in your life, Mary? I would miss it terribly. Yep. How old are you? 70? What? 89. Oh, 89, yep. Next oh, you, year, you made I'm me behaving. 90 I'm, I know I made you 90. <laughs> I love you. I love you too, Mary. Everything's going to be good. I if know. it isn't, I'm going to have to move in. Wait a minute. People often form very strong bonds with, with the elderly. That group of people, that population, was really affected a lot, uh, I think more than most, uh, through this whole protest. Quite obviously, they don't care about people. My, I run a, my food pantry, I had 48 families last night. I usually have about 32. My numbers are going to increase more because they come here because the prices are reasonable. Uh, in the neighborhood we're in, we do have a lot of customers that have no way to get anywhere else. We have a housing project across the street, two more down the street to our left, and so that's why we still have a good, good amount of customers, not great. On Monday night, uh, when we started asking people to boycott us, we had a customer, she came in almost in tears and um, Apologized to two of my managers saying that, you know, she understands the cause, she supports the cause, and all she wanted was a bag of rice and she was sorry for buying it here, which, which says the world to me. When the employees needed the help of customers, the customers were willing to go along and they wanted willingly to support uh, the employees. Because that happened, they were able to, to attack this, uh, this from two angles, right? One is keeping the stores open, but keeping employees committed and available at rallies and picketing every day out in the front of the store every day. And on the other side, to have customers boycotting, so they're uh, attacking the revenue and the cost at the same time. If this only started yesterday, we asked uh, the guys out there to start getting the petitions just for the customers. This is one store.
Not that I got to see the news too much because I really wasn't home, but then, you know, when I did, you know, and you'd see the people going and sticking all those other grocery stores receipts on the windows. And I mean, you'd see the windows filled up with them. I mean, it was just, it, it was awesome. I went to a London Dairy Market basket, walked in there, stood up in the manager's office and looked over a 110,000 square foot store and saw one person, one. That was the very first time I thought, might be able to pull this off. Hello. We're putting it on the Tatsuna. How many Tatsunas do we have here today? Please stop our competition. Please go to our competition and stay away from our stores. I bet you never thought you'd hear me say that. Customers, they were doing signing petitions on their own. You know, they, they stood outside our stores getting people to sign petitions. They did all kinds of things on their own. They got their own rallies together. Okay, let's, we're gonna do this by a show of hands, just to start things off. How many customers are here? How many of you customers who have your hands in the air are currently shopping at Market Basket? How many of you customers will return to shop at Market Basket with Arthur T. DeMoulis? Yeah! What you see here today is a microcosm of the two million customers that are boycotting Market Basket because we believe in Arthur T. DeMoulis as CEO and only Arthur T. DeMoulis as CEO. Obrero, juntos! Jamás serán vencidos. Customers united will never be defeated. And I want to end with this. The next time we do this, I want this to be a gathering in celebration because Arthur T has this store back again. Here's the problem. No matter what you think about this board, $400 million worth of cash is lost. Just as an example, 40 to 60 million dollars worth of fish was thrown out. There's nothing in the stores. There's no company. It's shut down. The, the reporters would ask me, aren't you fearful that you won't be able to recover this company? You know, you've lost two million customers every week. And my answer would be, I could certainly understand how the bankers would feel that that's just impossible. You can't turn off and then turn on a business like that. But the thousands of people that worked at Market Basket were also the company's customers. Family that shop at Market Basket, friends, cousins, relatives, we all shop at Market Basket. So the 25,000 people that work for the company also come with family and friends that shop at the company. So as soon as you get that word, you're gonna have hundreds of thousands of people running towards running a market basket. The market they want basket. their market basket back. I wasn't a big believer. I said, how in God's name are they gonna get, because I worked in commercial banking, are they gonna get this thing back up and running and to a certain level of, 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 of sales soon enough to be able to get a loan out of these banks, a, con a conglomerate of banks. I didn't think they could do it. Now I'm, th I'm thinking, I'm saying to myself, okay, I'm out of work, I have nowhere to go today. And I, the weekend was a nice weekend. Then Monday comes around and, you know, I'm, what do I do today? This is not my usual routine. I'm, I'm off today. I'm not working. Oh my God, Sal, I don't have to go to work today. He says, I know. So he runs out, he comes back about an hour later, and I'm outside enjoying the day. So I came, come back home, and I tell her. He says, all your people are down the street. They're all picking them down the street. You need to get down there. You need to get down there with your people. I, no one called me. Why didn't anyone call me and tell me this was going on? 
I don't know anything about it. He says, do you understand you're on strike? This is what you do when you're on strike. I said, strike? I, who the hell was ever on strike? I was never on strike. I don't know what this is all about. I have no clue. These are your people. This is your company. This is your job. You stick with your people. The board of directors for the embattled Market Basket supermarket chain is calling on workers to get back to business as usual. In a statement issued this afternoon, the board said it's considering buyout offers, including the one from fired CEO Arthur T. DeMoulis. WBUR's Kurt Nickish is at the Prudential Center. Where the, the site where we were all at across the street was almost a microcosm of what Market Basket is. You'd go in the morning first thing, and people are already there setting the place up, merchandising it. You know, the tents are going up, the grills are being set up. It was a business that had been abandoned. But they kept the grounds nice. They had nice grass and, and the parking lot and whatnot. Every department kind of picked a tree for shade, and they brought their bag chairs or whatever, and they set up around this tree. Every day it was the same people that went to that spot. We were lucky to have that across the street parking lot, you know, because what if we didn't have that? What would have happened? Where would we have went? So the guy that owned that parking lot, he goes, I believe in what you guys are doing is right. You can use that parking lot. And he owned that whole street down there. So he let oh, all the cars park down there. This guy was great. It was 95 degrees, you know, it was probably the worst summer ever. You know, I mean, it would have been great unless you were standing out there for 15 hours a day. But note to CEOs, if you're ever going to fire the president of a company, do it in January. Would have been a lot tougher standing out there when it was two degrees. If it had transpired during the winter, I've heard that commentary, but you know what? We would have all been out there with overcoats and snow shovels. <laughs> Where all this stuff came from, I don't know. All the logistics that went into it, I have no idea. But this is Market Basket, and it got done. The, the people that we, that we might answer to, they're here as well. They're setting the example. We have Bob Ferrante, you know, he's one of the accountants at the place. Well, here's Bob across the street with his beard setting up the, the food stand. We basically sum it up by a team effort. Nobody pulls rank on each other. We don't care who you are, where you work, we all work together. The Market Basket way, right? Yep, yes. that's it. The guy that does the catering truck for us, Mark Valente, he was across the street every day with his truck for us. Thank you. I've been here for almost 13 years now. I've been here in town 30 years. 30 years in December. I, 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 don't, I don't go out to the, the, the local places. I, I look for market. We're going back to work. I got the feeling. Right, Gary? Yes, We're going back, buddy. Going back. I look at my phone every night saying, Gary's going to text me. <laughs> Do the uh, security guys come over and try to eat? No, I would Absolutely I'm, not. I wouldn't feed them. That wouldn't work so well. They're not welcome here. I'm here for my guys and my guys only. These are my guys. Without them, I'm nothing. Go through him too next time, okay? Don't. It really was like a family out on strike. Ready? Uh, which down. again sounds odd in, from break a historical down, break standpoint, break but it really break was down. that way. People were, you know, people had barbecue going, people were eating, people were doing whatever, as opposed to you know, a more traditional auto worker strike or steel worker strike, we would see guys on a picket line. We, we try to do something different every day. You know, we try the pizza and the ice cream machine, and this and that. So, I work for a bunch of Greeks. Let's roast the lamb. Artie was so concerned about everybody there, and one day he had somebody drive by, very incognito, to see how we were all doing. And what did he see? He saw a lamb roasting on a spit, and he said, I think they're okay. <laughs> everybody played their roles beautifully and did their jobs tremendously well in the market basket way. Whatever that job was, support, sit under a tree if you can't walk, get over there and walk around in a circle. The first couple of days that uh, we were on site there across from 875 East Street, we were kind of all up on the grass and nobody was really doing the, the circle. It was actually, there was actually a member of the police department that kind of gave us the road map on actually how to get that going. He goes, oh yeah, he goes, I've done strikes before. You guys, when you walk these picket lines, when these trucks are coming out, you're allowed to walk in front of them three times before they tell you to stop. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. So one of the trucks were pulling out, 
hey guys, let's start walking in here so we can walk in front of the trucks and slow it down. And you can walk in slow as you wanted to go. Slow, slow, slow. Let's go! Today's the day! Come on over, guys, you can do this. We need as many people as possible. Hi, Louise. Watch where you're going. We just take turns, basically, you know? We see four or five people come over, another four or five people get up and swap off. They get something to eat, something to drink, switch off and come back. And they more than willing to come over. You bet we do. Yep, more than willing. They're all here for the same reason, to bring Artie back. You and the Cavalier, you're a loser too. <laughs> It hurts us down here when we see our guys out there at the office, you know, struggling. Right. And so we're going to do whatever we could to help them. Exactly. That's why we, we were screaming and yelling and saying, That's you right. know what, calling these guys the names for that one reason, because they're they're attacking our brothers. Exactly. Remember that scab gonna, driver at my store? Yeah, yeah that crazy guy. We I did, had we a, did I it stopped all. the truck and he drove in my store. Yeah. Get out! I'm disappointed in you and Germany is too. Get out! Hey! I was a crowd that was full of emotion and passion. That's right. Very but heat. very little, and I was out there a lot, he didn't hear the bad, vulgar swears. And if someone, no, no. If someone did, it was an isolated case, and, and, the, and the kids around him say, hey, 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 we don't do that. We're professionals. Right. We're professional pickers. Fuck you, you scab mother! Fuck you! Put the flag on the pole, on, get your man. shit together. Put the flag on. <laughs> this one. Nice car. You do it. We would say like dirt bag. Dirt bag, yeah, dirt but no bag. swears. No, no swears, but no, really dirt bag, no scumbag, thing, like and that. really yeah. get more, like, yeah. I mean, getting it, like, there's that line. You can get to the line and say what you want, you know? They got salty, but they didn't get violent. And you know, you got to blame both sides. You know, whether whether you're on the picket line or you're one of the people that cross the picket line. You know, there were birds flying in both directions. You got the trash we barrels. Got big red nose you can put on your clown. Couldn't buy your way into anything. Don't even know where to park your car, you loser. Make sure you get the pictures there, pork chop. Myself, I had to stay neutral. If I see someone saying something, if they got a little too high, I say, guys, turn it down. You know what? You could be heard, but you know, let's not turn this into where it's ugly. There were some people who had to go back in, and everybody had their own decisions to make and their own families to account for. And nobody could be blamed for going back in if they went back in. But that is not going to change the way people feel who are passionately putting all on the line. Some guys stayed, most of us left. It's a very touchy thing, an extremely touchy thing that I, I really don't want to comment too much about. I have a mortgage, I get bills. I just, I just sacrificed everything and put everything on the table and said, you know what? I'm just gonna stick it out just like all the other brothers and sisters are back here. You have to think about what's going on here. If we don't do this and get our company back, you're gonna be out of a job. Do you think Felicia and Gooch are gonna take you with them? You're out of your mind. The only way out of this is to do what we have to do and that's to get Artie back here. We'd go to Tom's car and uh, we'd sit in there and he would have his laptop in, in his car. You know, lots of times, you know, the game plan, when they would send out a directive, our answer to that, to the stores, would be something to kind of disrupt their plan within the bounds of the stores, especially the store managers and the store management, not disobeying what they said maybe to take their directive. If the directive might have said, the load is coming in, make sure you are there to unload the truck. 
when it gets there so it can move on to the next door. Well, something might go out after you bandy about some ideas and you just have one person with a jack unload that truck. Whereas normally you might have a team of people. Unload it. They said to unload it, unload it. But take your time. We're asking the stores to step up now. And if the person in front of you, your manager, your department head, whatever the case is, reluctant to step up, then you need to step up. For a lot of workers, the store is like theirs, right? It's like, no, you can't have our, you can't have our store. We won't let you do that. And the stores went out that way, again, with this sort of sense of everybody's in this together. This is our store. I take as good as care as this store as I do my house, if not better. You know, it's typically cleaner, it typically runs, you know, smoother, and it's typically less conflict in this store than there is at my house with four children. So, if they're going to tear down our house that we spent a hundred years building, we're going to light a match on the way out and tear it down ourselves. They thought this main office had walked out and these, these high and mighty people from our office were going to just quit their jobs and thought that, you know, the thing would shut down without them in the operational end of it. What they didn't realize is the people that all in the stores were in on it too, that we were going to shut the store down. You know what? We're not going to do any orders. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. We're not going to do any orders. We're not going to send orders. We're not going to receive orders. Slowly, as they saw people, oh, we're going to get in trouble. Oh my God, what's going to happen? They weren't used to it. We always follow discipline. But wait a minute. We're in a different era here. We're on our own. We're on our own island right now, and we're going to fight our battle right here. At that point, the company is really turning into two companies. So you have CEOs at the top. You've got just a handful of people who remained in those offices and uh, store directors, very little communication between them. And that's one company that was having tremendous difficulty functioning because uh, the, really the core decision makers were all gone. Then you have, I don't know if you would describe it as a shadow organization or you know, you have the other market basket uh, which was functioning on the outside across the street from the corporate offices. And this one was, uh, it was run partially by those eight managers who were fired and by the rest of the employees in the company. And that one, surprisingly, it, actually the communication between those people was tremendous. Those store directors were getting more information from that core group of eight people than they were from the CEOs who were officially in charge. What you had was a, was a group of a couple hundred people who spent the last three or four decades learning how to make this place run the best of anybody in the industry. So who better except those same 200 guys to know where to put the sand in the gears? So I was group texting the store managers and the assistant managers with instructions. Don't take your signs down, don't do this, do whatever. And the stores were pretty much listening to us. When, when I was told to take my signs down, yeah. I had them put up 10 extra. <laughs> <laughs> They took them down, not anybody I knew. They took them down, they went back up. But in my store, they stayed up. And what's, is, it, what's, the, uh, what's the plan going forward as far as that goes? Now the T's back, I'll take them down. In a way, when I started reading about this, I'm thinking, damn, these people are crazy. What are they doing? It reminded me, in a way, of you know, take something like the Boston Red Sox, where everybody likes a certain manager, and the top owners of the Red Sox decide we're getting rid of this manager and bringing in another one, and all the Red Sox say, no, we're not playing for that guy. We want the old guy back. Every now and then, you would get a, a one line, a two line from Felicia telling us to, you know, do our orders and so forth, but they were, they were just professional, and they weren't even answering the questions we were asking. You know, she was just telling us to, to do orders and the customers would come back. This leadership over here, Tom and Tom, and with input from Steve and everybody out there and Mike, and they decided, okay, you place your orders based on current volume. So, store would place an order for one pallet. Store would place an order for two pallets. 
we would get some communication saying not to order. Then at a point they told us to uh, actually order too much. So we took our scanning guns and we produced orders of uh, thousands and thousands of cases of groceries. Order like crazy. Order huge orders. That warehouse is not going to be able to fulfill those orders. That place is gonna go nuts. Keep in mind, between the grocery warehouse and the perishable warehouse, you're talking 1,200 loads a week. 1,200. You know, our guys load a trailer. You, know, you, you can't get an envelope in there. It's floor to ceiling, it's perfectly done. The quote replacements might get out 20. You know, that would be 20 trailers leaving. That doesn't say what was on them. This is a mixed skin. Household, pet food, spices. You gotta have a driver drive an hour and a half to drop off three skids. It's ridiculous. And to boot, they sent this thing up on a reefer trailer. This is this is a refrigerated trailer that they send dry grocery items on. Why? And when they would get there with those orders, refuse it because it would be incorrect. It's not what we ordered. We were going to do what we had to do. We honestly blocked in docks. I, had, I moved my employee parking area to my receiving dock. So you couldn't back a truck up there at one point. One of the truck drivers asked me the directions how to get here. Oh, yeah. I came up in North Conway. You know, that's where I put them. I'd do anything I can to give these guys the wrong directions. You know, anything. We did everything and anything. Any little trick we could come up with, we would do. Just to be part of the resistance, you know what I mean? That's what we have to do. We took groceries in. Like I said, we unloaded trucks like snails. But um, not something we do, and you know, it's against, we want to crack the whip, say go, 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 but well, you're going too fast, we would say. And it's something that never come out of my mouth working for Market Basket, slow down. It got to be a competition amongst our managers. I would get a call, hey Stevie, we just finished a grocery truck, five hours and 18 minutes, is that the record? You know, it was from a guy just down the street. And I'd say, no, no, someone took five and a half hours. She was adamant to say that, you know, we would to place these orders and the customers would come back. I don't know what she didn't get that the customers weren't coming because we asked them not to come and they were on board with what we were doing. She, she just seemed to not even understand that. And I don't know how that could even be, again, with the media, Facebook, all of that out there that the customers stopped coming. You know, there was point counterpoint being played along the way and our guys were playing chess and those two were not only just playing checkers, they didn't even have, have enough pieces to play checkers. So it was pretty cool. I think it really scared the people, the, the new board members, that they, they said that this is something they'd never seen. The only thing they could come up with is, is uh, someone's doing this behind the scenes. Well, who's doing it? I guess people have a hard time understanding that that actually was mm -hmm. grassroots and it really wasn't organized, because it, it wasn't. Early on, we would go to the Cracker Barrel almost every morning and we would meet. During one of the rallies that we had, I remember making a speech I'd seen in the, the Herald that day, this guy named George Regan, I'll never forget the guy's name. Mm -hmm. There was some public relations mogul in Boston said that if you think this is being done by a couple of guys that get together at Dunkin' Donuts in the morning, you're wrong. And I said, no, you're right. It's not a couple of guys at Dunkin' Donuts, it's eight guys and we're at Cracker Barrel, you know? <laughs> I'm really getting ticked off with people telling me we can't win this. They have all these experts that are telling me, well, you can't, you can't win. That's never happened before. So what? They don't know us. We're not normal. <laughs> Look at this. And this is incredible. I am so humbled by the outpouring of support. I didn't look at having the futures of 25,000 people on my shoulders. That was on the board's shoulders. That was on Arthur S's shoulders. That, you know, they, they were the ones that made that decision. I never saw myself doing this. I never did this for anything but the love of my company and my job. Never looked for another job. Never filed for unemployment. Just kept going every day. And, and we were really just naive, you know? We weren't smart. We didn't think we were labor 
big shots. We weren't trying to create some movement that was going to change the country. We simply wanted Adi T back. We, we generally have a strategy meeting every morning. Um, the six or seven of us that kind of um, run this revolution, I guess you'd call it. Any news that we hear, or uh, anything that was on media the night before, or whatever we share, um, and then we kind of strategize for the day what we're going to do. Um, after that, we kind of try to keep everybody here upbeat. You got a hat on, you won't burn. Come on! <laughs> You too! Look, I said. You're golf. Who's getting 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 stand oh, over here? Come on, all people. Let's get some Youngest recruits. supervisor in the department. Go ahead. During the course of the day, uh, we may have little meetings. Maybe not everybody together. Maybe just a couple of us together. And you know, hey, we heard this. Maybe we should throw this out on media or whatever. And, um, and that's kind of the way the whole day goes. Everybody was dying for information, okay? And it was very hard to get information. We were out across the street in touch with nobody um, as far as what was going on at the board level or how Artie was fighting. We knew he was fighting every day, but we could get no information. I've had to actually, in the last couple of weeks, just tell my guys, I said, you know, take the day off tomorrow, put your phone down, if something happens, will know, you know what I mean? You have to separate a little bit because it consumes you. I feel this weekend is over. Yeah. It's over this weekend? Yep, yeah. that's what I feel. Maybe not today, but... This weekend. Come Monday, we're going to be slapping groceries. Stock. It's time for ASD to stop being a greedy ass. That's right. There was a lot of misinformation. There was a lot of information out there that people thought was real. People who thought things could be solved in this kind of a transaction in an hour were mistaken, they couldn't be solved in three days. And some of the stuff that was coming out saying we're near a deal, well, I can tell you, they weren't near a deal. Shouldn't get off the butt, give us the answer. That's all. Are you solid? You're not solid. You're a company, you're going, what are you doing? Give me some answers. But it was gut-wrenching all the time, because sometimes the meetings were called off, and there was no meeting scheduled for later. And then, you know, gradually, when you're looking around saying, is there another is there another uh, uh, stalking horse? Is there another deal out there? Are we really going to get trumped by somebody else? You just didn't know. And it, I, I, it wears on you every day. You know, I wake up every day afraid that I was going to say the wrong thing to someone. We quickly realized that everybody was watching every move we made and they were looking for body language they were trying to get close to us if they saw a couple of us talking they would come over and they would try to try to hear overhear what we were saying during the course of the day across from the warehouse it was put the smile on i remember one day in particular one of the truck drivers came up to me and he says uh it's a bad day yesterday, huh? Then it in fact was, but I don't know why that would come out of his mouth. I said, eh, a little bit, how'd you know? He goes, we saw you throw the water bottle you were drinking against the side of the building. <laughs> I said, I, well, memo to self, don't throw bottles against the side of the cinder block building <laughs> if anybody can see you. We would, every day, wait for a call to say that this thing was over. I remember it was maybe a week or two in, and I think Mike Kettenbach was on his phone, and Tom was over by him, and I was watching them. And then Tom and Mike both looked at me and kind of gave me this, get over here. So I thought, this is it. And I bounded over there. And I think Mike asked me something about, where, what's the name of the place that you went to eat two weeks ago? And I was like, geez, you know, my heart was beating through my chest. I thought this was it. 
And we turned around and everybody was watching because they wanted to know. And I just ran and people thought this could be it, but it wasn't. So th at that point we started moving to the dumpster. There was a dumpster behind the building. So every now and then a group text would come up and you look down at your phone and it would say dumpster. And uh, it's time to go. And there were some times we were in the car that I would go in the car with the computer because I didn't want people to see me or see what I was doing or, you know, and I have my MacBook and I'd be looking up, you know, we, we would hear information about Del Hayes or something and there was a connection there so I'd be on the web trying to find out what the connection with Del Hayes is. But yes, we had to be very careful. Um, and you have to be upbeat because if I have all the selectors and the warehouse folks and all the girls taking that leap of faith, can't leave them hanging. Who are we? Marketing. What do we want? Marketing. Yeah. We thought this was an easy no-brainer, but then it kept going and going and going. And then they said it can't go much longer because the company just can't be viable. I have faith and I'll, I'll go down with the ship in a second. Right. Not a problem. But after the, sick, the, the ship sinks, what, what's Mark and I going to do? We only know Market Basket. That's all we do. That's all we know. So what are we going to do? Sit down at the table, everybody. It was a family meeting. Mark and Pass is going south right now. A lot of things are happening. Dad, is it really happening? It's really happening. So I'm going to let you know what I'm doing. And I'm going to risk everything. Right. And they were all on board. Stephanie exactly. was on board. Everybody was on board. My kids were on board. That's they all right. went for Market Basket. It was very hard to deal with. I mean, again, as an individual, as a worker, you know, you're going there for information, trying to find out exactly what's going on to try to relay some good news perhaps to the rest of the people you work with and your family, your loved ones, and just, oh, we're, we're not sure yet. We'll know something tomorrow, and then tomorrow comes, and it's like, well, they have a meeting on, you know, on Thursday, so just give me a few more days, and then just next week. It, it, it was very, uh, very stressful, though. Very stressful. I definitely saw the bigger picture in this. I knew he felt so strongly about it, but I also felt like they were fighting something bigger. It really showed what the middle class is really going through and working for. We were saving for a house at that point in time, so we did have to tap into our savings, which, you know... Which dwindled <laughs> greatly. He was not going back there no matter what. No. Um, so... And I, I did go to Hannaford's and fill out an application. Mm -hmm. and, and did a couple of side jobs throwing junk in a right. trash bin out of houses, like <laughs> right. and a couple, couple of portraits, portraits here and there. A couple you of, know. you know, art jobs. Yeah, it certainly helped during that time. I think it was also kind of therapeutic, too, because certainly, <laughs> certainly. to sit and work on the art and not think about right. what was going on with Market Basket right. at the time. It, it, it helped. When I have to, I, I certainly use my artwork as a way to run away without leaving home. <laughs> That's for sure. The Market Basket saga continues as pressure, both public and financial, continues to mount for a resolution. A spokesman for the supermarket chain's board of directors says the board is considering selling out to one of several potential buyers. It held the including third day of its job fair in Andover, but it was the first for outside applicants. And even though people could email in their resumes, more than 100 showed up by car or on foot. Waiting to meet them was a mass of current market basket workers. Well, today we're uh, over here, they're having a job fair, trying to fill some positions of people that they fired, that they shouldn't have fired, and uh, that's the whole deal today. They set up a job fair in Andover at one of the warehouses. So they moved 
the rally from Tewksbury over to Andover. Buses, carpools, whatever it might be. You know, we were down to the job fair, and I, that made me angry also, because I'm in Andover, they, they wanted to rehire for our store manager jobs. They said we weren't showing up, but we were working. You know, we blocked the entrance, see what's going to happen. Let them know that it's the wrong thing to do. Listen, you, there's no jobs out there for you. Don't, don't even right. try. Well, we didn't end up hearing of anyone that was hired through the job fair. Um, a lot of people saw it as another scare tactic. It was kind of another instance of an ultimatum that the new executives were saying, you need to come back by this day or your job could be replaced. Each of those uh, threats was worrisome because there was a real possibility that uh, people uh, would be fired. I, I lay in my bed at night crying because I thought in my 35 years with this company I would never ever experience this. As the drama wore on, the co-CEOs insisted that staffing be proportional to revenue in some sense, so there was this painful layoff of part-time people that happened that really turned the screw in some sense. That was perhaps the strongest uh, push from the other side, and one worried whether that was going to break everything. Uh, during this uh, shutdown, in a sense, of our company, to tell the most vulnerable of, of associates, truly the most vulnerable, the part-time are the most vulnerable people, the ones that need us, and to tell them, we don't need you anymore, yeah, it, was, uh, it was devastating. When it came down that um, I could not schedule my part-time associates, my tough skin came out and I'm, I, I grabbed my assistant that was on duty that day, unfortunately Wally, and I says, um, we can't schedule any part-time associates next week. I'll never forget it. And I apologize, Wally, but he was in tears. And he said, that's the hardest thing I have ever had to do was what I just did. And that's when it hit me. I'm like, my God. I have to do this to the rest of the store. There's the generations of people that, you know, are, this is their livelihood and they contribute to a household, you know, especially in where we are and this is an in inner city. So a, a paycheck from a part-timer goes to a household. It doesn't go to spend on sneakers or anything else. It's part of their living expenses for, you know, a week, a month or whatever it takes. And Gooch and Felicia laid off those part-timers. I think it blew up in their face because then all the politicians got involved because they're seeing these people. It's a major amount of people to be on the, all of a sudden unemployment. I began talking with my commissioners about the possible impact on the state. So certainly knowing that uh, we had about 9,500 people who are employed by Market Basket in New Hampshire concerned me. Um, and so I was also trying to think through what it would mean to the state, particularly our unemployment fund, uh, if this walkout continued. I really thought about it as um, an impending disaster but instead of a natural disaster, it would be one caused by a family dispute. And that seemed to me to be something uh, that we should try to prevent if it was possible. How does that affect the family having, you know, somebody not working who was working there? She's more depressed than anything. She's kind of given up hope, I think, at this point. Really? Yeah. So what do you think? You think this is going to get over today? Uh, you can't trust any anything they say, so you don't know until it's done. I had to come in and I had to talk people off the ledges every day. You know, I had to make sure that they understood that things would be okay, even if I didn't think they were. The lowest point would probably be that week or so where the Del Hayes Hannaford rumors were really going strong. And you know, I, I'm, 
I was hoping the boss wouldn't make any rash decisions trying to protect us, to be honest with you. There were all kinds of deals proposed and deals that fell off the table, and one that stayed on the table longer was the, uh, was the foreign buyer, uh, Delhays. It got, it got quite, a, quite a ways along to the point where uh, there were serious meetings about, about uh, everything with underwriters and, and lawyers and all of that. You know, Arthur T. really, really wanted to make a deal because of, of what was happening outside the companies with all of the people that were out there protesting the whole thing. And I know he talked to a lot of people that selling the franchise uh, to someone else and taking the money and leaving would all would ruin the company whether he went with them as CEO or he didn't. And so I think he redoubled his efforts to try to find a solution for his family. The lawyers, and there were plenty of them, uh, decided that they were absolutely, positively running out of time. Last night another deadline or another board meeting has uh, been canceled. Uh, it seems to be this morning, there's, there's more issues this morning. Bottom line, this is criminal, what's going on here today. An awful lot of people being hurt. When is enough enough? Yeah, it's been really hard on a lot of people, you know. Can't pay their bills, we're not getting any money coming in, and it's getting scary. Why don't you guys just put on a pair of gloves and get in the ring, you know? Do something to solve this. I mean, there's a, the livelihoods of thousands of people are, are on the line. For the first time in my life, I'm worried. I have a 16-month daughter at home. Uh, my wife stays at home with her. I don't even know. My words can't even explain how nervous I am right now. So, I don't know. I think we're doing the right thing. There was a truck driver fund set up that raised, I, I think it was almost $300,000. But when you have 700 people, that's not a lot of money to go around. <laughs> Many of us drivers have a lot of years here. Our children are, are grown. A lot of the warehouse help here, younger individuals. And if you saw at the rallies, a lot of children in strollers. Whatever is donated to, to me in that fund, I'm going to hand it down to a warehouse worker so he can feed that kid, those little babies. I can say personally that we received two checks from that fund, mm -hmm. which, which certainly helped. The people at the top that orchestrated this whole thing, I got to think, Many of them were sucking down antacids every night before they went to sleep thinking, oh my God, what have we done? We've just taken thousands of people out of their jobs. We don't know if this is gonna work. What have we done? Each individual piece of news didn't seem like it was moving in the right direction. It always felt like, uh, like everything was getting, like people were digging in more and more. It really had that feeling of, uh, could this company that had done so well actually go under in a matter of weeks because of this? There are times you let your mind go to a very bad place and think, what are we doing here? This is not going to end well. The shelves were empty. There was no real understanding of how fast customers would come back. There was a lot of thought that customers were now shopping in other places and maybe you had lost them. I think people worried that they couldn't get through six weeks, uh, let alone eight or 10. Um, it was, it was, it was on the brink. There was a lot of spite there. I think that the hatred was so real and so deep that the last person the, the other side of the family wanted to sell to was Arthur T. DeMoles. There was to be a board meeting that afternoon we had heard of. A board meeting in the afternoon, it's gotta be over. The governors were involved, everything's gotta be there. And then that board meeting lasted all of 10 minutes from what we understood. 
nothing happened in there. We were all crushed. I remember going home and just thinking how what these board members were doing was absolutely criminal. And we thought we were doomed. This one, for some reason, really affected me and Steve Palenka. We were so confident that it was going to happen. And we couldn't even contain it anymore. We couldn't be up for them anymore. You know, it's like a high school date. You build up, build up, build up, and then nothing. And then I got a phone call on the way home. By the time I got home, things were much better. You could sense things were happening. So that was like 4 o'clock. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to take off. And then one of the guys says, now wait around, you know, like, the way he made it sound like we're going to hear something soon. We had been burned with too many of those Sundays that we thought this thing might end. So I went to bed. I got a phone call from uh, the Boston Globe wanting to know what I thought of the agreement. What agreement? He said, the agreement, uh, they have agreed to accept the offer. This is a done deal. He goes, yeah, we got people there, they just came up. I was so excited. I had tears in my eyes and I was hugging Nicole. It was, it was finally, it was probably about 11 o'clock or close to it that we got the final word that yes, it's a done deal. I wasn't even happy. Wow, I was, it was definitely an I can't believe we did this moment. It was more a sense of relief than euphoria at the time. I just, I don't know if I couldn't believe it or thought that somebody's going to pull a, pull a Lucy on me again and pull the ball away. I don't know, but I, I, I didn't believe it. The 11 o'clock news came on, and they announced that they agreed. Are you kidding me? Did I just hear that? And he said, yes, you did. A co-worker of mine called me and said, the deal is done. The deal is final. He's back. And I jumped in my car and drove to Tewksbury. I must have gotten here in 10 minutes. And I live in Lowell. It takes me about 20 minutes to get here. Um, just very excited. I thought about driving to the office, but then I figured I might be able to get a little sleep now. Could it have happened sooner? Sure. But no one was ready. Finally, I think cooler heads prevailed with both sides of the family and the, uh, the lawyers. There was, always a, there was always a question of whether Arthur, Arthur S. would sell to the Arthur T. side of the family. That was always a question that was behind all of our thinking because uh, there was a lot of people thought that wouldn't happen. I'm so excited. I'm trying to call my workers, tell them to come back to work. We have so much work to do. It's there's no answer for this, you know? I'm so excited. I was out there for six weeks. I never had a tan like this before, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so happy. Uh, happy, happy, yeah. Happy because and I hear, uh, I just jump. Yeah, and in my crying, case, I jump. I just go, crying, ah, yeah. Crying, and crying. I go, I go right away and kiss my, my wife. We're back. Gentlemen. You happy to be back? Yeah. After six weeks, the Market Basket food fight is over. The company and Arthur T. DeMoulis announcing a binding agreement which sells the company to Arthur T., who returns effective immediately with day-to-day -day operational authority. It's a major victory for company workers who virtually shut down the grocery store chain for weeks as they protested for Arthur T.'s return. So I show up at the office the next morning early. The elves got to chatting and uh, we kind of thought we should end it the way we began it. So we got the stairs back in my truck that the elves built. 
and we parked it over on the grass on the corner facing the flagpole. He showed up and it was, it was just a swarm of people uh, trying to get him out of his car and stuff. And they ushered him over to my truck. How are y'all doing today? The associates of Market Basket, the customers of Market Basket, and the vendors of this Market Basket organization. You, and only you, have taught the educators, you have taught the professors, the analysts, and the CEOs that the workplace here at Market Basket is so much more than just a job. And he probably doesn't remember it, but he ended it where he started it, in the back of that blue pickup truck, and uh, nothing could be so, uh, so sweet. As, as happy as he, as he was, uh, he was, uh, he was very nervous about what the next few months were gonna be. How much time do I really have to get this thing fully functioning so that I can have a real shot of uh, being able to pay this debt down? Do I have an office left? <laughs> sort of. It's not occupied, is it? <laughs> <laughs> These are our favorite customers. We love these people. Uh, customers knew full well there wasn't going to be uh, roast beef <laughs> and, and vegetables uh, there. They came back en masse on August 29th, on August 30th. Uh, why did they do that? They came back because they, were, they wanted to support what had been done there. That puts a lie to this, this, uh, this notion that the customers were only staying away because they knew there were more groceries there. Hey, you're open! <laughs> I don't have to tell you, we're happy about the resolution. Good to hear, we are as well. You're going to have to be back? Oh yeah, we're going to be back. We're wicked happy. Oh, I'm thrilled to be back. This is like the best news ever. We're going to have an RT party. How, uh, how did you hear? Uh, last night at 11 o'clock, my husband woke me up. <laughs> And told me that we're back in business, so that was great. Are you happy? Yeah! yeah. When you're happy, 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 but, I mean, that was the only feeling, like, let's get this job done. Let's show everybody what we can really do. Everyone just got right back to work in a matter of hours, really. People some said they got no sleep at all or just a few hours. Their job at that point wasn't to celebrate it. It was just to keep doing what they always did. So in the fall after we won, the Labor Secretary, Tom Perez, invited Market Basket to come down to Washington, D.C. and be a part of a speech he was giving at the National Press Club in which he was going to talk about Market Basket and the events of the summer. Thousands of employers of the regional uh, supermarket chain, Market Basket, walked off the job to protest the firing of their CEO. Your communities are proud of all of you. Uh, your president, I can tell you, and your labor secretary are very proud of you. And um, I think your nation is proud of you. 
This is not simply a New England story, this is an American story. It's a story I see across the nation. A story of workers, managers, everyone with a we're all in this together attitude, coming together to make sure that we reject false choices. It's not just about taking care of your shareholder. We take care of stakeholders, our workers, our, our shareholders, our community. That's what the market basket story is and that's what the American story is. I did have a, a, young, a young guy, uh, 20 years old, he's full time, just came full time. He came up to me, almost tears in his eyes and says, I got a job offer at uh, Hannaford, full time, I don't know what to do. And I said, I would love to tell you that everything's gonna be great. Okay. My heart, I believe it, but take that job if you need to and you can always come back. And he did. And he came back. One, two, three, market basket. The back, um, in most people's minds, better than ever. Uh, customer counts are up. Um, the new store openings, the new stores that open, the five of them are doing very well. There's plans down the road to open more stores. One indicator of how well the company is doing since Arthur T. was put back in charge is the year-end bonus. Despite all those millions of dollars in lost sales, the company actually paid out more money in 2014 than it did in 2013. Forty-six million dollars, they said, where it was 44 million the previous year. These are 599 bottles, master mixes, limited two per person. This was an example of direct action which doesn't again have as its enemy all of capitalism, just a certain kind of capitalism that they do not respect and we're not going to work for. One left for you. I have a hard time thinking that any employer in the United States of America can stay open by being as, as zen about the way that they run their stores as people intimated. But I think it's reflective of how badly other people run their businesses. That this place isn't perfect, but it's a damn sight better than so many other places that, that people who work at Market Basket know about, so it's worth saving. If we're gonna change this country, and if we're gonna teach the next generation of business leaders how to manage in ways that work for these different stakeholders, then we've got to get more of this information out uh, across the business school curriculum and across the business schools in this country. America has a choice. Which kind of employer do we want? Do we want the high wage, high profit employer that makes the business work for both customers, for employees, and for shareholders? Or do we want just to maintain this notion that business only exists to maximize the shareholders' value and everybody else has to fend for themselves? That's the choice we have, and that's what the Market Basket case really illustrated. I'm so relieved. I can't, I can't believe it. Take a look at that sign up there. Lost and found, hidden, safe, and sound. Turn around, watch this sound.
Attention shoppers, the first rule in business is the customer is always right. Except in this instance, apparently, nothing to see here. Move along. A tisket, a tasket, dear market basket, firing your loyal employees, that's pretty classless. Get your head out of your asses, listen to the masses. You greedy corporate fascists. I don't know nothing about running supermarkets, but someone sound the gong. I think it's safe to say that you're doing it wrong. Uh -huh. Your company's as good as the company you keep. Excuse me if I'm testy, I haven't eaten in a week. RDS, let me ask you a question since you're so wealthy. How do I get more for my dollar if the shelves are all empty? Your employees resent you immensely, now the public agrees. Listen to me for you go out like Bradley. Say hi to Mrs. B. A task it, a task it, dear market basket. I cannot believe how long your obstinance is lasting. And to make it worse, you just come across as bastards. Trust me, in my news feed, it's like every other status. Let's bring in the Radio Shack guy. Look how awesome that is. Fighting for a CEO in the history of time. Well, mm, no. I'm just an average show consumer near the cooler who has been buying my chicken cord and blew this since it was called the Moolahs. When you remove the heart of it, you're left with nothing. Can't you settle your family feuds at like a cookout or something? Please. I mean, you damaged your brand and worse, you inconvenience me. There's only one way to fix this, you idiots. Bring back RDT! Ah, well, at least I won't have a problem finding a parking spot. Gathered in the ground